are simply just monsters. But let's get back to Gloss Witch and see her take on this. Next. What makes a father kill his children? We are asked, before being presented with a mishmash of narratives about divorce, depression, custody battles, jealousy and debt. And ironically, those are some of the reasons given in the stories I just presented. Next. It seems that we are living in a world where the division between normality and annihilation is paper thin and breaching it merely depends on the wrong thing said, the wrong man spoken to or the wrong divorce settlement proposed. Men are, we are told, on the edge. Apparently not just men. Next. According to the crime writer Nietzsche Jarrett, it is impossible to see the real signs of danger at the time. If you ask which of us have felt shame, rage, distress, loss, a burning sense of unfairness, a despair for the future, half the world will put up their hands. These family annihilators are just the ghastly outliers of a culture in which failure batters at the sense of self, and in which shame can trump love. Best be careful, then. Your children could be next. When Sari Fuller killed his three children with a hunting knife before plunging to his death, the Daily Mail was keen to compare his jealous rages with his wife Ruth's flirty texts, as though these constituted some form of provocation. In cases such as Sykes's and that of Michael Patterson, a broken man who stabbed his children to death, the blame is seen to lie with family courts, denying loving fathers the access to their children that is apparently their right. Well, actually it is their right, or at least it should be. Some men lose everything during a divorce. And although financial things can be replaced, your kids cannot. This drives an extremely high number of men to suicide. And a very small minority to kill their kids. And obviously I don't condone anyone killing their kids, but isn't it reasonable to figure out why some do, and try to fix the problem which is causing it in the first place? But Gloss which has no sympathy for men who have been torn apart by the courts, in fact she has no sympathy for any man, she only sees them as an convenient excuse to blame all the world's woes on. And of course, no mention of females who do this same behavior, as she wants to paint this as a male-only phenomena. After all, how could she claim, it's extreme masculinity, not love or despair, that drives a father to kill his children, if females commit the same acts, and in greater numbers? But it only counts when males do it, right? Next. Writing on Christopher Foster, an indebted businessman who shot dead his wife and daughter before burning his house to the ground, John Ronson looks at Foster's neighbors and muses on how easy it is when lives start to go wrong, when their manhood and the trappings of their wealth are threatened, for the whole thing just to unravel. While manhood and fatherhood are mentioned, playing into the common theme of masculinity in crisis, questions of male power and its illegitimacy tend to be overlooked. It is as though the sense of grievance is perfectly reasonable, even if the response is extreme. The messages that emerge from such narratives are devil-edged, adding fuel to the fire they seek to douse. A similar problem arises with broader discussions of father's rights and masculinity. No one dares to say, what you have lost was never yours to begin with. If men grow up expecting to acquire ownership of people in the same way one might acquire wealth, as easy as sticking pink and blue pegs in one's car in the game of life, then they are destined to end up feeling robbed. The masculinity in crisis narrative already tells them they are being deprived of something essential, something to which all men who lived before them had access but to which they, inexplicably, do not. Oh, so a father being heartbroken over the loss of his children is really just a man being angry at his perceived loss of property. In other words, all a man is good for is his sperm and cash. Unbelievable. She just has no compassion or understanding towards men at all. She just sees every action as a sinister act. Masculinity is not some fragile butterfly on a wheel. It depends on reducing other people to objects. The solution is not to recreate an imaginary golden age in which said objects were, so we tell ourselves, more pliable and less likely to disrupt the narrative. A world in which not only jobs were stable and not going anywhere, but neither were women and children. 
that will dehumanize over half the human race and we should temper our sympathy for those men who would openly mourn its passing. As the feminist Kathy Miriam argues, the problem of masculinity has displaced a systemic, structural analysis of male power and has displaced the problem of men possessing women. Our obsession with masculinity's supposedly never-ending crises merely bolsters the myth that if women and children are people, men cannot be. So tell me again how feminism is about gender equality. How can a movement which has such negative views about males and masculinity, and has such little sympathy for our issues, truly represent us? The answer is it cannot. If feminists truly want gender equality, they should be condemning the likes of Gloss which, unfortunately, a large percentage of feminists would agree with her, and the rest are oddly silent. But before finishing up, let's look at what Gloss which has to say about mothers and their image. From, why do we assume there is an evil mother behind every violent man? Jen Jordan was not a perfect mother. Nonetheless, had she not been stabbed to death last Saturday, her parenting flaws, her alleged alcoholism, the fact that two of her children had been taken into care would not be common knowledge. As it is, Jordan, who died alongside her partner and six-year-old daughter, apparently at the hands of her adult son, has been given a posthumous trial by media. The verdict, announced by papers such as The Telegraph and The Daily Mail, has been unanimous. Jordan is guilty of the kind of mothering that leads to just the kind of crimes her son committed. No wonder Jed Allen did what he did. What first appeared to be the story of a violent man's brutal attack on those closest to him has become the tale of a little boy lost, subject to the whims of a selfish, uncaring mother. According to Mark Kane, a former soldier who had a four-year relationship with Miss Jordan from 2001, Jordan was the best mum and the devil in disguise at the same time, Jed saw a lot of dysfunction. I imagine he snapped with his mother and couldn't take her anymore. Consumers of the latest news reports require quick answers and straightforward conclusions, up to a point. We want to know what led Jed Allen to kill. It was, it is suggested, because his mother drank. Do we want to know why his mother drank? That is less interesting. Jordan is not a real person, merely a cause. She is the archetypal bad mother whose existence serves no other purpose than to seal her children's fate. Mothers are origins, points of blame, not actual human beings interacting with others within a broader network of social, economic and cultural constraints. Men do that, even murderers do that, but mothers must say still. Amazing isn't it? Imagine for a moment, it was a young woman who had stabbed her alcoholic father to death. Based on Gloss Witch's stance on males and masculinity, what do you think her opinion would be? Would she be defending the dead alcoholic father, or making excuses for the daughter who killed him? I think I know the answer to that question. To feminists like Gloss Witch, everything is seen through the lens of gender. If a male commits an act, be it harmful or benign, it's because of masculinity. Yet if a woman commits the exact same act, then clearly it's not her fault, she has no agency, and she is somehow victimized apparently even when it comes to farting. I consider myself a reasonable person, and I have no problem with discussing issues with my opposition, but unfortunately individuals like Gloss which are extremists, there is no reasoning, there is no middle ground. Everything is black and white. Men are the problem. And women are their victims. In the eyes of Gloss which, even trying to discuss this narrative which in any way questions its validity, proves it to be true. So reasoning with her isn't possible. Fortunately, these people are easy to expose. Anyway, that's it for now folks, so until next time, always remember, don't drink the poison Kool-Aid. Yeah. Uh -huh.